He is commercializing the biosensor technology to increase the success rate of drug development in immuno-oncology. And we got to go to Professor Diamond's uh, lab uh, in April and play with calipers and uh, all kinds of fun measurement devices and laser <laughs> cutting <laughs> devices. So um, if you imagine a bunch of monks and nuns playing around an engineering lab. <laughs> <laughs> And last night, uh, we were uh, enjoying very much uh, designing our own new smartwatch to replace an Apple smartwatch. Uh, we looked into what are the challenges in our own mindfulness practice and see in pairs we came up with um, new smartwatches. So, Professor Diamond. Can we turn on the lights here? Somebody by the light switch. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we'll start with one sound of the bell. Dear Sangha, hello. <laughs> My talk will be entirely me speaking in the whiteboard. I do have notes. Engineering. <laughs> Does anyone have an idea what, what this might be? A glass half full? <laughs> Are there any pessimists in the audience? It might be a glass half empty. Have you ever asked an engineer? They'll tell you that the glass is twice as large as it needs to be. <laughs> when I was a child, I had a collapsible cup. Sort of like this. I used to take it camping, but it leaked. So I used it at home. <laughs> and my favorite thing to do with this collapsible cup was to fill it with water, drink just a little bit, and to try to get 
the top, just the top part, to come down. <laughs> so the glass was exactly the right size. <laughs> <laughs> The problem was that uh, when I would tap it, uh, it would usually collapse at the bottom, and all the water would spill over me. <laughs> so, I think I've been an engineer for a long time. Engineers are also the kind of people who walk around thinking that you can solve a problem like climate change with lasers. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> so what have I learned here at, the, uh, at Deer Park in this wonderful retreat? I've learned that I've arrived. I learned that I am home in the here and in the now. And I look around this beautiful great hall, the big hall, ocean of peace. I notice many things, <laughs> like the way that the airflow system has these huge pipes. And they start large and they get smaller as they go down, to let the air come out so that we get a balance. And I look at the sprinkling systems, sprinkler system. And you know, there's a little glass tube holding uh, glycerin. And if that glycerin raises to 155 degrees, then it breaks and the water will shower down and put out a fire. And it, and it's beautiful the way the architects have blended that protection of our safety into the space. And I see on the, of the altar, arrived at home. And what do I think about? I think about lasers. <laughs> I, th I think about how to get the beautiful calligraphy cut, to cut the wood into those intricate shapes. You could use lasers. <laughs> Perhaps that's how it was made. Many of the gifts in the, that are being offered to raise funds for the brothers' new hall are cut with lasers. <laughs> and some of you might know some of you might not know laser light Amplification through stimulated emission, radiation. Laser. Essentially, the way it works is you, you excite some atoms in a crystal to emit some light. And you cleverly use mirrors to 
allow that light to bounce back and forth and stimulate the emission of more light. And it comes out through resonance, it builds strength, becomes stronger and stronger. And we can get enough power from that light to vaporize through the plywood and to cut the beautiful calligraphy. <laughs> Let's talk about a problem. Let's talk about stopping climate change. This is a hard problem. When we look at the trends, things are getting worse. In our brain, Give it a central sulcus, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, parietal, frontal. Looks at this and extrapolates. And it doesn't look good. So the brain is concerned. This could lead one to experience even climate despair. The connection between climate and health and public health is strong. So what makes this problem so difficult for us? Well, it does involve trees, but these are people. <laughs> it also involves animals. Plants. Oops. What's this? Salt. Minerals. <laughs> crystalline structure. And these days, we need to add one more. technology. So this problem of climate change involves 
our relationship with technology, our relationship with animals and plants and minerals. There are many ways that this is interconnected. So in, in my field of engineering and design, this is sometimes called a wicked problem. And there are various theories of change. how to approach them. Here at Deer Park, in the here and the now, maybe we'll try this a different way. We'll try the practice of change. So what would be the foundation of engaging in a practice of change? Awareness. And if we sustain that awareness over time, that's concentration. And it's from sustaining the concentration that we gain insights. It's a good start. It's also not enough. We might need investigation. Scientific investigation, that's why we're here. And analysis, all these tools uh, from engineering and science can help to analyze what we learn and together with our insights, we can cultivate understanding. It's from that understanding that we can begin to approach what I like to call problem solving and design. In our space here, if you look around, you'll see the large things I was mentioning. And in fact, if you look closely, you'll see that every square inch, every millimeter of this space has been designed. 
Everything here has been transformed. And whatever has been transformed through design can be redesigned. We created the space. We created our world. So through that problem solving and redesign, comes the transformation and healing. The beautiful thing is that transformation and healing feeds back. It supports the beautiful people. It supports the the animals, the plants, the minerals, even the technology can become more healing. So what is this design? What is all this design activity? In a nutshell, it's a process. We need to design. Build. Test. Repeat. As we learn. We all run experiments on our every day in our lives, in our work through our practice with ourselves as we improve and grow and develop. And one thing that we learn is to start small. So considering all this, you might say, what can I do? You could share a mindful vegan meal with your family. plan the meal, you design it, you buy the food, you build it, you serve the food and enjoy mindfully, you test it. If that goes well, maybe you try it at work. And it goes to a larger cycle. Maybe one of you has replaced the, a cracked screen on a cell phone before. Maybe a couple of you, few have done that. It's not so hard. And it's something you can teach. You could run a little clinic at lunchtime. Repair your iPhone. That works well. Maybe you take another cycle, say, you know, this product we're working on, do we allow our, our customers to repair it? So you take it another cycle. Maybe you form a Sangha and you work on yourselves and your relationships to animals, plants, minerals, and technology. And that begins to develop. And these activities 
of community coming together, helping one another. Well, it's a kind of opportunity for stimulating each other to transform your energies to do more good. It could even amplify. So you might call that all that love. Love amplification. through stimulated emission of hope, or as I like to call it, a laser. So if we plot the hope axis, that can grow geometrically. The thing about our brains is that we, we extrapolate in a linear way. We have a really hard time with things that are geometric. Feedback loops that are positive we don't understand so well. So then we're so surprised when it happens. So this is the collective awakening. feels so difficult to, to access this until you start taking it one step at a time, one breath at a time. So maybe we, together, can solve climate change with lasers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Saul.